Welcome back to the Legal Weekly Wine, where we discuss the week's hottest legal topics. We are in the week of September, and I have to get this right, of September 17th. And the reason I say that specifically, uh, Dr. Viles giving me the heads up, is because it's Constitution Week. And we, especially at the Weekly Wine, want to celebrate Constitution Week because we have our constitutional scholar with us. So that's the special edition today. We are going to be finding out everything you ever wanted to know about the Constitutional Convention, including who was there, when it was, why it happened, what amendments were proposed, and many more questions. If you ever were interested, or even if you didn't think you were, stay tuned because this is actually fairly interesting stuff. I'm Virginia Tarani. I'm with Tarani Law LLC because you never need a lawyer. It's how you do. And joining me as our regular guest is Dr. John Vile. He is with the Middle Tennessee State University Honors College as the dean. He's a longstanding political science professor and scholar, and especially does research and has expertise in the Constitution, the Constitutional Convention, the amending process, uh, the, goodness, the list goes on. Uh, most of the American symbols, constitutional law, the Fourth Amendment, the First Amendment, and we are privileged to have you here. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Vile. It's a pleasure. Constitution Week. <laughs> yeah, I know that it's one of your favorite weeks of the entire year. It is. I actually got to speak at a community college on Monday uh, on the Electoral College. I was on nice. a panel. Okay. And then yesterday, uh, all state colleges, I don't know how many people know this, but all state colleges and universities, as of about 10 years ago, are required to celebrate Constitution Week. Oh. And some of us take that requirement not simply as a requirement, but as something really exciting to do. So we always have, among other things, a reading of the Constitution outside of the Honors College. Nice. Our president, Dr. McPhee, our president, joined us yesterday. Aww. But I got out taught by the business dean when they did theirs they had an associate dean come and sing the preamble. So next year, uh, we did at, at Saturday's football game where we beat up on Murray State. Uh, we did have one of our freshman Buchanan students sing the national anthem. Um, when she told me she was going to do it a cappella, my first thought was, does that mean she can't carry a tune? Oh, but no. But she did. I, I had actually heard her carry a tune. I had just never, I had never heard anything at that range. And she belted it out. It just did a magnificent job. Oh, amazing. So somebody goes to the MTSU Honors website, somewhere there they can find her singing the national anthem. And again, she just did a wonderful job for us. Wow. Well, that's incredible. And as I also understand it, your the, the Honors College is doing another special this week. I don't know if it just happened to fall on Constitution Week or if it was already pre-scheduled for its 50th reunion. We are. That's right. Uh, 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 the Honors uh, well, it was actually founded as a program. Dr. June McCash, uh, who was one of your professors, if I yes. remember correctly, a French professor, uh, started the program back in 1973. So we are celebrating uh, 50 years, have a big banquet planned and some outside speakers and a lot of lot of guests, and we are looking forward to it. Uh, and Monday on our campus, we had a panel with a uh, former uh, U.S. Senator from Tennessee, Bob Corker, oh. and Representative uh, Jim Cooper, uh, who basically did a, it, it was very, it, you know, it was very fascinating because you know, it used to be you could be on other sides of the aisle mm. and you would still converse and have friendships. Um, and I think for the Trump generation, there were some in the audience who had never seen a Republican and a Democrat both on the same stage who were complimentary toward one another right. and clearly were working toward common goals. And I think it was uh, it was not my it, I was not the one who invited them, but we have the American Democracy Project. Mm. Uh, our our chapter of that uh, housed in the Honors College, and Dr. Evans, who he had set up, invited our speakers, and it, it went on a good time, as as did the panel that I was on in, uh, at Columbia State University. Wonderful. 
Well, that's very exciting. And I want to talk about your books. Um, but before we get to that, with the weekly well, Can line, I say one other thing? Well, if you're that excited, then absolutely. I am. Okay, Saturday. I mean, what college professor gets a chance to be in a parade other than, you know, if you were in the band in high school, which I was. <laughs> Uh, but Saturday, uh, God willing, and the creeks don't rise, uh, I'm going to be in a 1969 Stingray Red Corvette wow. uh, in a parade uh, in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So I'm sure many of your viewers are going to want to get on a plane immediately Everybody, and get down and see this. I mean, it is happy hour on Friday, so you have time. <laughs> We have time yes. to get there. <laughs> well, I hope some people take some pictures. I would love to include them on our website and social media posts <laughs> as to what the legal weekly wine hosts are up to every week. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do the wine. Um, I have gone back to one of the first wines that we did on the show, which is a Commendador. And it is a red wine from the Moriah Vineyards out in Manassas, Virginia. Um, a lovely, beautiful, silky wine um, that feels like it goes with anything or just plain. So, cheers. I believe you actually have something other than water, maybe a soda. I, I do. It's, this is uh, Pepsi. I forget what their slogan is. Uh, but whatever it is. <laughs> well, it's good because we're equal opportunity. We had a Coca-Cola a couple weeks ago, so now we have Pepsi. Yes. It's it's good. We're not promoting one or the other. And cheers and happy, happy hour. I'm trying to remember which one, you know, when Kennedy took his trip to Russia. Um, I'm sorry, John Nixon, as vice president, visited Russia. And he was there, among other things, to promote either this was a so-called kitchen debate, and so it was held, I think it was like a World's Fair or something being held there, and he was at the American exhibit on a modern kitchen, and so he was he was touting all the advantages of capitalism so that people had refrigerators and dishwashers and this sort of thing. Uh, nice. But he also, I can't, and I can't remember whether it was one or both that he was promoting there <laughs> in any event. Very interesting. Vice presidents have it rough sometimes. <laughs> they, they really do. Yeah, just just terrible. And was it, I thought you were going to mention the one, was it Kennedy who said, I am a jelly donut, speaking in, well, there, in the there is, language? there is controversy about that. He, he, it was when he went to West Berlin, he said, Ich bin ein Berlander. Uh, and some say that there was a jelly donut at the time that was called the Berlander. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure about the accuracy of that or not. Uh, I know we story. did have, when we were in Lake Charles, Louisiana, the reports were that one of the one of the attorneys had gone to a meeting in France and announced that he was an avocado uh, <laughs> instead of an advocate, which is fairly easy to Instead of an avocado. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I had uh, my my boyfriend in college. You'll remember this. Went to to France. Went to England and then visited me in France for a, a quick uh, a quick minute while I was doing a study abroad. And he kept saying that people would approach him and he would say, "No, parlez Francois." <laughs> no, parlez Francois. And I was like, yeah, I think they're going to know you don't speak French when you're saying you don't speak Francois, which is a name, a male's name, not. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't think it'll be an issue. Um, <laughs> so I believe in speaking of France and I want you are the expert. Is there anything from France that made it into the Constitution or that helped lead to provisions? I know we're heavily influenced from England since that's mm. where most of the immigrants came yep. from. But I believe at least, and maybe this is more towards once the presidency began, I know that Thomas Jefferson spent a lot of time in France. And I'm wondering— That was not at the convention. Correct. He Either was he not nor at the Adams. Adams was in England and uh, or Great Britain, and uh, he was a diplomat to France. So, did anything from France um, make it there, or yes. what other influences are we looking at? 
might have been some possible influence of Rousseau on many of the founders, not nearly as great. Most of them think as John Locke, who was an English philosopher, but probably the French philosopher who had the greatest indirect influence would have been Mont de Marin de Montesquieu. Mm. Uh, he had written a huge book called The Spirit of the Laws and is usually credited with the idea of separation of powers. It wasn't necessarily unique to him, but he certainly emphasized it quite a bit. So, uh, and in fact, there's quite a bit of discussion of Montesquieu in the Federalist Papers, which were uh, a series of essays written in support of the Constitution after uh, after it was signed. By Benjamin Franklin? No. Or is that just a uh, rumor? No. The, the, the Federalist Papers were primarily... They were written under the name of Publius, which was the name of a Roman statesman. It's very common at that time. You know, it'll sign something as Caesar or Cromwell or Publius or whatever. Um, and the Federalist Papers were the, the, the greatest number of essays were written by Alexander Hamilton, okay. who had not actually spent that much time at the convention, uh, maybe a month out of the, you know, May 15th through September 17th period. Uh, Madison, I think, wrote the most brilliant uh, essays. And then there's about five or six of them were, that were written by J uh, John Jay, primarily on the diplomatic aspects. Jay had not attended the Constitutional Convention, but, you know, obviously knew a bit about the deliberations. So who was there? If we're missing John Jay, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, James Madison. No, 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 no. No, James Madison was there. John <laughs> Adams. John Adams. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I swapped yeah. them. John Adams. Yeah, no, that's fine. So Madison was there. Who else was there? Well, I mean, there were a total of 55 delegates from mm. all the states except uh, Rhode Island. So, you know, 12 of the 13 states had delegates there. Um, Madison was among the most influential. James Wilson of Pennsylvania was very influential. Uh, Governor Morris, who was representing Pennsylvania, but also could have claimed New York, uh, was the one who spoke the most. Uh, Roger Sherman of Connecticut. Um, you know, Madison's often called the father of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. That's not quite right. Um, but if you go head to head in what Madison wanted and got and what Sherman got, wanted and got, they were about equal. Sherman might have even bested him on that. George Washington, of course, was there. He was elected as chair of the convention. Uh, he didn't say very much. Hmm. Uh, he didn't generally say a lot. Uh, on the other hand, it might he might not have considered it appropriate as someone who was presiding. Um, and again, you know, uh, Edmund Rand, you know, you can go sort of state by state. Hmm. Uh, most of the, you, you know, most Je Jefferson, Mr. Jefferson later referred to it as an as an assembly of demigods. That's not quite accurate. <laughs> um, you know, there were some people there who didn't particularly, and, and there were some, I mean, to take an example, George Wythe was there for about a week. Uh, his wife was, was deathly ill and he oh. returned home. Uh, Wythe was one, the first uh, law professor in the United States from Virginia. Uh, George Mason was there. He ended up being one of three individuals uh, who did not sign the Constitution uh, because it did not contain at that time a Bill of Rights. Um, and he left pretty discouraged, I think, of the convention, you know, although it came around a little bit after the Bill of Rights was adopted. Benjamin Franklin was there. He was the oldest member. I believe he was 81 at the time. Um, he seems to have been as useful Maybe for what he did behind the scenes, as he did at the convention, he was always he was always the one when when things got who would propose a compromise or tell a mm -hmm. funny story or uh, make a reference to something in the Bible that sort of brought people together. Um, but it was you know it was a very a serious group of people. Um, you know we we forget. So you know we declare our independence. Uh, 1776, mm -hmm. uh, the war's over, 1781. You know, in the interim, we, we adopt the Articles of Confederation, which are basically almost close to a treaty or uh, was sometimes called a, a League of Friendship. Mm. 
um, you had a single branch of government, Congress, uh, which was unicameral, a single house of Congress. Each state was represented uh, equally. It had very limited powers. It is we call it a confet. We call it the Conf Articles of Confederation because structurally it resembles what we today call a confederal government, which is to say, your 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 when sovereignty was divided between what we would call the national government and the states primary powers continue to rest in the states. Mm. The, the centrifugal forces were greater than the centripetal forces, if you will. And as a consequence, you know, Congress, for example, had no power over interstate commerce. Congress did not print uh, a common currency. Um, and, you know, when it came to foreign affairs, generally the 13 states had it together uh, but they ended up, it was common for states to tax one another. Uh, customs duties were the, were the primary taxes of the time. And it was said that New Jersey was a, like a cast with a tap on, on, on each end. You know, To the north, uh, New York was taxing it. And to the south, I guess it would have been Pennsylvania or you know, one of those states. Well, it almost and, sounds like it was really set up as if they were competing countries rather than well, what we know as the states today. It was set up more like European countries. You know, again, a, a league of friendship that the, there was, the, there's still textual ambiguity. You know, if you read the declaration of independence, were they declaring thir were 13 of them independently claiming independence or were they doing it together I think they were doing it together, but there's there's enough ambiguity there that yes, in some ways it, in some ways it might be closer today to today's or let's go back to 20 years ago what NATO would have been like. Mm. You know, you have states basically allied for purposes of self defense, um, but not a lot of you know, and and some people by the way <laughs> think we should go back to that. Think that. Uh, and I used to think to think so until I started reading articles like the one in this last month's Atlantic that asked, is Tennessee uh, democratic any longer? <laughs> and and, and we're, we're far ahead, I think, in democracy in many other states. Uh, yeah. Ma but Madison was one, actually, who who tended to argue that if we had a government, a central government over a larger area, it would be less likely to divide into factions. It would, well, not to divide into factions, it would be less likely that any single faction would control. Interesting. And so he, he, he argued, and this was, by the way, you mentioned France, Montesquieu had argued that Republican government was only possible in small states, and Madison and others had to make the argument that no, we can, you know, we can, con consolidate isn't quite the word because the, the framers did not adopt a unitary system. In a unitary system, you don't have sovereign states. You don't have states with their own constitutions, their own designated boundaries. So we didn't go to, to what the British have, unitary system, but we decided ultimately that the, the government under the Articles was inadequate and we needed a more centralized government than that. And okay, so, I'm going to pause. I'm going to yeah. pause you. Um, okay. because I'm not sure how many of our listeners, and, and I'll admit for me, it's been quite a hot minute since I studied the actual beginning of the constitution. Um, mm -hmm. but especially in this day and age in, in looking back and in reviewing governments, mm -hmm. the articles of confederation that you're talking about yes. sound an awful lot like, and forgive me for my, for me sounding naive, but I want to make sure we clarify this point. How is that different? I know they're, they're different documents than the Articles of the Confederacy. No. But were they right. based on each other where the Confederate no. states were trying to complement it? Well, the, the Confederacy, right, is an example of a confederal government. Okay. But, and, and, you know, we still have the argument, what was the Civil War fought over? Was it fought? Most Southerners today 
want to say it was states' rights. Others say, well, slavery was, you know, the primary difference between northern and southern states had to do with slavery. So that was the underlying issue. But although it was, it was, it came closer to a confederal than a federal government, the Confederate Constitution was actually pretty much word for word the U.S. Constitution with some minor change. Well, one, one is not a minor change. There were several explicit mentions of slavery. Okay. Uh, in the U.S. Constitution, they always use euphemisms, mm -hmm. such other persons not taxed or that sort of thing. So it recognized slavery. It included, by the way, a reference to God, mm -hmm. which should alert people that just because a document does or does not mention God doesn't necessarily mean that God or it. Um, it had a, if I remember correctly, there was a one a six-year term for the president who was not electable. Um, and there were a few other, I believe there was an item veto, although I'm never sure, I'm not sure that it was ever exercised, but I believe the, the president had an item veto. And there were a few other differences, but basically uh, it was it was the US Constitution as members of the South had come to interpret it in the first hundred years or so. Okay. So now why did, and going back to then the revolutionary time and the beginnings mm -hmm. of the government, why did they feel there was a need to change from this Articles of Confederation to what we know as the U.S. Constitution? Good. Well, again, part of it was there was a perceived inadequacy in Congress. The, the other thing we didn't mention in a confederal government, as I understand it, operate directly on individuals. It has to operate through the states. So rather than have a national income tax, for example, and we didn't get that in the U.S. Constitution for many years later, but under the original Constitution, under the Articles, the only way you could get taxes was to requisition the states who would then raise the money for you. And the same thing was true of raising an army. Mm. If you needed an army of, you know, 200,000 people, you might ask New York for 20,000 and Virginia for 30,000. Okay. But you would be dependent on them actually raising the troops and sending them on your behalf. So Congress did not have the power to tax and spend like our current Congress. And again, they had no control over interstate or foreign commerce. So states literally, and this goes back to, you know, why I said it was like NATO maybe 20 years ago, you know, England could put a, a, a tariff on goods coming from France and vice versa. Well, so too could New York and New Jersey and Philip, you know, Pennsylvania and all the other states. Sure. Now, the, the other issue was that even, well... Between the time that th there were two meetings that preceded the convention, one was a meeting of some delegates at Mount Vernon, de delegates from Maryland and Virginia, actually. They were, having, they were having disputes over navigation on the Potomac River, mm. and it wasn't clear, you know, who had what authority. So they met and worked it out, and then the clever ones among them said, well, you know, why don't we you know, why don't we call a larger convention to deal with commerce in general? And that was the so-called Annapolis Convention. And only five states showed up. Uh, but apparently Hamilton and Madison, who both attended, said, let's use this to call for a constitutional convention, uh, which they did. And that's that's the convention that began in May of 18, 1787 and lasted through September 17th of that year. Okay, now while that was going on in 1787, oh, okay. what right. was happening with the presidency? What, well, what about George Washington? <laughs> okay, okay, now hold on. There was no, there was no president, but let's go back. So I said the, the other, the other problem with the Articles of Confederation is partly because the national government had to requisition states. If, if there was a rebellion within a state, if a state was threatened by anarchy, it wasn't clear that the national government could sufficiently intervene. 
And so what happened, there was a taxpayer revolt called Shays Rebellion uh, in Massachusetts between the meeting of the Annapolis Convention and the Constitutional Convention. And Congress had to go through all kinds of subterfuges. If I remember correctly, they appropriated money for to to deal with possible Native American uprisings, mm. which in fact was designed to try to help Massachusetts to keep it from being over the government from being overthrown. So that that impetus seems to be one of the and just generally the economy wasn't doing well. Uh, America was not, you know, when American diplomats went abroad, nobody could be sure that they were speaking for all 13 co former colonies. Okay. And so they didn't, and, and a lot of people were just, you know, they were almost like vultures waiting on the sidelines. You know, the European, you know, Britain wanted its its colonies back. You know, France, France and Spain were waiting they had in, in the wings. And so... It, it the 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 dip a lot of the impetus I think from the convention came from people who had been abroad and said we just don't get the same kind of respect that other governments do. Hmm. Okay, so okay, but no presidency. Okay, but let me back right. up a minute. So no presidency in the articles in the art. Well, in the articles, Congress reigned supreme. Only it wasn't supreme. It was what the only powers it had were conducted basically by Congress. And there was, I think there was technically a president of, of, of the Congress, if you, you know, somebody that they would elect to lead them. I believe a man named Hanson is sometimes credited as being the first president of the United States, but he wasn't, he wasn't a president with the same kind of independent separated powers that our president has today. Now, and, and speaking of all of this, your one of your books, I think it is the one on the Constitutional Convention, has the cover with this amazing photograph of a, a painting that that seems very ingrained, at least in my memory. Is this it? That is one of them, though. There's yeah, no, the other a, one. Yeah. This is. I got to mention. Okay, you brought it up. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Constitutional Convention of 1787, a comprehensive encyclopedia of America's founding. Uh, the other one, which is a sh right, that's two volumes. That's particularly great if you teach American history. But if you just want a quick read, I have a mm -hmm. short volume called "The Writing and Ratification of the U.S. Constitution," and I'm trying to remember. I believe that's Cleo, who is the muse of history, okay. maybe telling virtue or uh, I don't remember, virtue or wisdom. You know. Uh, in, in founding a new country. Isn't there another, maybe it's with the Declaration of Independence where Washington is, stand, is standing all regally with his arm out um, and the group of what seems to be Benjamin Franklin and others. Is that? Well, now, okay, it probably would have been Hancock because Washington was actually out in the field oh. when the Declaration of Independence was signed. Uh, hmm. I do have, yeah, I that was the tie that I wore on Constitution Day Today, I'm back to my Philadelphia tie, uh, which comes in either a yellow or a blue. Uh, <laughs> Do you have both? That has my preferred method of communication, uh, the quill pen. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> I would ask if you have one on your desk, but you might and just not know it with as well, many things are on your desk. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Okay, so... I do have a nice statue of Mr. Jefferson on my desk, the author of the dec primary author of the Declaration of Independence. Which would be hard to miss, a statue. Yes, it would. It yes. would be. With okay, with him gone and John Adams. Yes. What how did they even vote? Because again, in my in my little layperson's mind, even though I studied government. I, I think it's just naturally we keep having these pictures of, well, it was all the first presidents who clearly met. They're they're the oh. ones who counted the first presidents and Benjamin yeah. Franklin and He wasn't Alex the president. I, <laughs> I know, I know he wasn't, <laughs> but these are the men that I picture. Yes. Uh, you know, clearly wrongly so, but I think we're so entrenched on who were the first presidents that at least I end up trying to associate them still 
with the Constitution. Yeah. The only two presidents, future presidents who were there were George Washington and James Madison. Okay. And both were highly influential. Madison much more in, you know, basically what, so let's go back to your question, how did they vote? Under the Articles of Confederation, each state was equally represented. They could have X, like two to seven delegates, but they only had one vote. They operated oh. on that same principle at the Constitutional Convention. So typically you'll see a vote that'll say like 11 to one or five to six, meaning, mm. you know, five, four, it's six against it. One isn't there. One never shows up. Maybe the other is divided or isn't there yet. But that's um, per state that it's talking about of the each, people right, in the each state. state. And, and when, when they say in the end, w when the Constitution was sent to the people, to the states for ratification, it was said that it was adopted unanimously by the states present. And that's because, and actually, that's even tricky because Virginia, I believe there were five remaining delegates and two of them, Randolph and Mason, refused to sign but there were th still three who did. New York, the th out of th two or three, out of three delegates, only one was left. So Hamilton had to sign on behalf of himself oh. rather than at for on behalf of the entire state. Uh, but you had, you know, you had very articulate people, and, and basically what happened the. The convention was called, if you, if you read the resolution, it was basically called to revise and enlarge the existing Articles of Confederation. And I think most delegates probably arrived thinking, okay, we need to give some, you know, we need to give some power, some greater powers to Congress. Sure. Uh, what happened is the Virginia delegation, I believe the first outside delegate to arrive at the convention was James Madison. And, and most of the other delegation came fairly quickly. And what Madison did is, seems primarily Madison, there were others in the Virginia delegation, but they, early in the convention, they introduced what's known as the Virginia Plan. Mm. And it really, it did not meet the terms of the convention. It did not revise and enlarge. It basically said, this system isn't going to work. We're going to propose something new. It replaced so, it. Right. So you start with, you know, you move eventually, and not all of this was in the original Virginia plan, but you basically move from a confederal government to what we today call a federal government. You move from one independent branch of government to three branches, hmm. legislative, executive, and judicial. You move from a one house Congress where each state has a single vote to a two house Congress where under the original plan, states in both houses would have been represented according to population. Now that changes the Virginia, they debate the Virginia plan for two or three weeks. Uh, New Jersey, uh, we in Patterson says, you know, we, we want a chance to, to have a, a closer, a, a plan that's closer to the articles of confederation but but interestingly, and, and anybody who's ever been to a meet, you know, if, if you know anything about agenda setting or if you've ever been to a meeting, a lot of times if somebody comes with a pre prepared plan, even if nobody else knew about it, that's going to set the original tenor. And if you debate yeah. it for two weeks before you offer an alternative, by that time, you're probably convinced, OK, I don't see anything wrong with having three branches instead of one. Right. Uh, who cares whether it's bicameral or unicameral? Uh, what the small states cared about was their loss of power in Congress, because whereas they would have been represented equal, it were represented equally into the Articles and at the convention. Now they're being asked, both houses of Congress, let them be represented according to population. And, you know, Virginia was three or four times maybe more so larger than many of the other states there. Mm. And, you know, there were a couple couple large, Pennsylvania was fairly large, Massachusetts. Uh, I don't think New York was anywhere near the current population. But in, in, in any event, you're the, the, when, when Patterson introduced the New Jersey plan, they wanted to go back to 
equal representation. And as you know, the, 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 the convention has been called a series of compromises. And the most famous and disputed today is the Connecticut Compromise, where you know the most undemocratic part of our Constitution is that each state has two votes in the Senate, regardless of its population. And so I believe it's something like if you're in Wyoming, your vote is worth 70 times more you know, toward a member of the Senate than it would be if you were in California. Right. California or, or New York. It's right. Right. Or in, any of Texas and any of those large states. So, you know, eventually. And then, of course, the the other primary. Well, I don't know if it was a primary. Well, the, the another major compromise had to do with how you would elect the president. Uh, mm. This was a panel that I served on earlier this week. We, you know, today people don't understand. They think it was a conflict between popular vote and something else. No, uh, there were some delegates, including James Wilson of Pennsylvania, who favored a national popular vote, but it really wasn't practical at that time. Mm. You know, communications, transportation were so much was was so different than it is today. Uh, so. The primary way that most nations at the time, most semi-democratic nations, was a parliamentary system mm. where parliament would choose, you know, whatever the majority party or faction in parliament would be, they would choose your, your chief executive would be their leader. But that conflicted with Mr. Montesquieu and with other advocates of separation of powers, which was if your president is chosen particularly if he's subject to re-election, if he's chosen by Congress, he's going to be beholden to Congress. Oh, interesting. You know, he who pays the piper calls the tune. And so the Electoral College was this elaborate mechanism designed, basically gave something to everybody, but it was designed to provide an indirect method of election. And then, you know, a third compromise, which in some ways was, was the saddest in terms of its longer term consequence was the compromise basically to leave slavery alone, uh, to permit continued importation for 20 more years, mm. and then to give slave states, which obviously were never going to enfranchise African Americans voluntarily, to give them credit for three-fifths of a person for every uh, slave that was in the state. Right, And so this this over in, in early American history, this overrepresented the southern states. So if you look at the first, oh. you look at the first step, well, six presidents, four of them are Virginians. And the most pivotal election probably at that time was the election of 1800, where Mr. Jefferson defeats Mr. Adams through the Electoral College, but that's partly a result of the uh, of the three fifths clause. If Virginia and the Southern states hadn't been given credit for their slaves, which they did not enfranchise, and even uh, though they weren't voting, that's right. Wow. So you know, the, and and there's you know there's no there, it, it's hard to put a lipstick on that pig. I mean that it, it was what it was. Oh, I, I will say. You know, there was there, there's been a large discussion. Was the Constitution a slave document? Well, the Constitution left slavery where it was. It didn't seek to expand it. It then the fact that it didn't use the word is suggestive that the delegates were very uncomfortable with the institution, mm. and and particularly you know in, by 1820 1830. You have all kinds of Southerners arguing that slavery was a positive good. Uh, it's good for the, obviously for the white planters, but it's also good for the slaves because they don't, you know, they're not capable of uh, of ruling themselves. Right. Uh, of course, which is poppycock. Uh, but but nonetheless, in 1789, you don't find those arguments. Mm. You find people like Mr. Jefferson, who's the slave owner, right. saying. Uh, slavery is like having a fox by the ears. Once you grab him, what do you do? You know, if you let him go, he's going to bite you. 
uh, we're stuck with it. Uh, we got to make the most of it. We, you know, we sort of hold our nose, you know, let's not talk about, let's not talk about it. The employee company right. were included in the constitution, but realistically, particularly South Carolina and Georgia yeah. made it clear that if you, if you take any measures against slavery here, uh, we're not going to, we're not going to continue uh, as part of this, you know, new new government. Interesting. Well, let me ask you another p- question then. In talking about the Connecticut Compromise and your mm-hmm. explanation and example, it's mm-hmm. let me say what I think that I heard, and then see if I can twist it for today. Okay. So, what I think that I heard you explaining is part of the reason that we came up with or agreed to the electoral process rather than just a straight popular vote was the issue of communication and travel, that it was harder to do that. So it seems that it would have been easier for the states to hold their own and collect their own ballots then and then send their representative. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Now, okay. Well, and what you're hearing, so the Connecticut Compromise dealt with specifically with representation in Congress. Okay. When the Electoral College was subsequently devised, it used the mechanism. So the each state has a number of electors based on the total number of members of the represent, House of Representatives, which is based on population, and it's two senators. So it it gives an element of federalism to the Electoral College, and its defenders uh, think that this is still important. We, we are, when we vote for the presidency, we're not simply voting as one mass, although we largely do it on the same day, but we are also voting as citizens of individual states, and particularly, you know, if you're from, you know, if you're from Wyoming or. Idaho or, you know, some of these particularly smaller rural states, you know, we ought to get some representation just because we're states. Hmm. And, it, you know, for better or worse, that's embodied within the, the Electoral College. It's well, sort then, of a secondary compromise. Then is it time for change where if we now have, if we take away the communication problems that we had with, yeah. you know, we're hardly doing horse and buggy it takes how many weeks to travel from a you know a largely southern state to a northern state they had to travel to the convention and stay there and come back so since well, we've no, rem- they, right you you don't actually travel to dc you you travel the the delegates would assemble within their states right then they would submit presumably through the post office or Oh, or, or, right. But the convention, yeah. they had to travel and stay at the convention, correct? Well, it's not a convention. I mean, that they, they meet together on a one-time basis after each election, and it's always a different group of electors each time. Oh, the, no, no, no. I mean the original right. constitutional convention. Okay, it did not serve as, it never served as an electoral college. Yeah, I get, we're talking okay. in contrary purposes, um, okay. where I'm basically saying the people who went to the Constitutional Convention. Right, they I'm would assuming, have been, they had the same kind of travel issues and transportation. Uh, they wouldn't show up issues. for a week and go back no, home that, and then come back the next that's Monday. Right. That's right. Um, so that's if right. we take away the travel issues and the communications issues that we used to have, is it better or would the founders have adopted the full vote by well, popular it, vote? It's hard to say. I mean, part of what's happening here, those who, who, are, who favor federalism, some of them still support the Electoral College because it does give some representation, a little bit larger representation to those smaller states. Um, There are some parts of the Electoral College, though, that have have drastically altered two by constitutional amendments. So the 12th Amendment, after a debacle in, in the election of 1800, after all the delegates who voted for Jefferson also voted for Burr, they said, well, we're going to make it because each elector was supposed to cast two votes and whoever got the higher votes 
would be president, assuming it was a majority, et cetera. And so they, in 12th Amendment, subsequently decided you'd cast a separate vote for president and vice president. Mm. And then the 23rd Amendment, I believe it was, <clears throat> later provided that we'll give three electoral votes to the District of Columbia. Okay. But far more important than that is, I think the way the founders originally conceived of the Electoral College was that, you know, your viewers would elect people like me, Right who presumably know a little bit about the Constitution or maybe, I would. maybe not so much like me. You know, they, they, they would elect people that were leaders, political leaders within their state mm. that they thought would be able to exercise judgment. Remember, part of it is, you know, people from, I, I probably know, I probably know more about many senators out of the state than I do my own governor. Oh, huh. Uh, and, you know, because you think, of, you know, who's on the national news? Well, it's not usually the governor. You know, right. even in the state news, often national issues are more. So originally it was thought we will elect wise people who will be more for me. You know, they've been in national assemblies. They'll know these people better than we do. That quickly disappeared. It quickly became... You know, do you support Jeffersonian Republicans? Will you pledge that you will vote for Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr? Yes. Okay, mm. you're going to be an elector. Mm. Well, today, when you cast a vote for president, you're voting for a, a group of electors who are pledged to vote for that candidate. You And if they exercise independent judge, judgment in many states, they can be, they, they can, somebody can substitute in their place or they mm. can be fined for being a so-called faithless elector. But the other very consequential decision that has been made is all but two states, uh, Nebraska and Maine, use a winner-take-all system. So if you get, if you win 51% of the vote in, in Tennessee, you get all of Tennessee's electoral votes, or Maryland, mm -hmm. or whatever the state is. And so you could win a large state by a single vote and pick up 40 electoral votes and, you know, lose another state. The, the consequence is you can win the national election, popular vote, as Al Gore did in 2000, right. as Hillary Clinton did in 2016, and still lose the electoral vote. And frankly, in some ways, the, the sad thing about the elect, one reason you're never going to get an elect or, where it's very difficult to get an electoral college change is one party now clearly sees that it has been advantaged somewhat, at least most recently, by an electoral college. It's almost a shame that one of those elections didn't go the other way, mm. you, you know, where one would be, well, Republican got it this time and a Democrat got it this time. But it's, you know, amending process, as we know, is very difficult. You know, two thirds of both houses of Congress, three quarters of the states. And every, you know, people are looking more toward electoral advantage than they are to abstract matters of, you know, democratic theory. Well, with the with the winner take all system, is that put That's into the Constitution? In the Constitution? Then how did it's they come not. up with that? Well, it's not con in other words, each state determined how they were mm. going to do their votes. So, and it, it, I, I don't know. I think some states actually might profit uh, from dividing their, you know, the, one of the problems with the Electoral College, or not, I mean, it depends on your view, but one of the issues with the Electoral College is, you know, all you have to do is a mass, seems easy, right? 270 out of 538 mm. votes. And if you know, I mean, frankly, if you're running for president and you're a Democrat, God bless you if you come to Tennessee. Uh, we're in the middle of a huge media market, so you might be able to get some media attention in surrounding states. But, you know, even if you have 666 on your forehead... <laughs> If you're a Republican, you're going to probably win the election in Tennessee. So there's not a lot of incentive. And the same is true, by the way, for many, you know, if you're a Republican 
you know, if you want to cause the Democrats to spend a little bit more money in California, you might make a trip or two there. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you can have a fundraiser there, but Cal you're not going to get California's votes. And so mm -hmm. most election, you know, we can you can already look at the, you know, look at what was in contention last time. Mm -hmm. You know, Georgia, Pennsylvania, yeah. Wisconsin, uh, Arizona, Arizona, New Mexico. You know, there are about seven to ten states that are truly contested states. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is aggravated by, now not for the Electoral College, but this phenomenon is aggravated in Congress by gerrymandering. Because most people okay. who are running for election and re-election in Congress are running from basically areas where one party dominates significantly mm -hmm. enough that if you can get that R or you can get that D by your name, you're going to win or lose the election accordingly. Mm. Not, it's not foreordained, but it might as well be. So we have, in some ways, I think that's a much greater problem uh, in many states right now, you know, partisan gerrymandering particularly, where the, the you know, a leading party might have 55% of the representation in the, in the in an existing legislature, that they're going to draw the boundaries so they increase that potential in terms of outlook to 70 to 80 percent. Right. And so you don't. And and, and th this is one of the reasons that we have such a dysfunctional Congress right now. If if you're if you're in a district that, you know, every two years there's a close contest between Democrats and Republicans, you're far more likely to try to appeal across the aisle than to say, and frankly, Republicans, and this is probably true, lesser tr true of Democrats, but it's true of both. But if you're a Republican, you might be far more concerned that you will be outflanked by another Republican on your right yeah. than you are about being defeated in the general election by a Democrat. Mm. And to some extent, this is true in the Democrats as well. They don't want to necessarily be outflanked because voters in both parties tend to be more extreme. So you're, right. you know, your you're, you're true gospel people are the people who vote up for the primary election. And interestingly, you know, one of the first lectures that, that I remember from a political science course at William and Mary back in 1970, I believe it was, when I first had a course in it, uh, was someone who got up and challenged the primary system. Mm. And I thought, well, that's ridiculous. You know, primaries, this is a progressive, but his argument was a good one. So few people show up at the primaries yeah. that the people who show up tend to be the people on the extremes. Mm. And they are driving, I think they're driving us into the ground, frankly, uh, both sides. But this is one of the reasons that our current Congress and current political system is is, I think, in, in utter disarray. Interesting. All right. So with that, they did not have the party system as we know it. That's right. But how did different parties that they did have affect the actual voting? Because it sounds like not everybody actually agreed well, on it. Well, okay. Talk about two different things. At the okay. convention, the deliberations were secret. Oh, and and that was that was highly. Pr and could you have it? This is one of the problems. You know, I've also written a book on, you know, the so-called Article Five convention mechanism. Could we have a convention today where the and states I, I call it right? And and one thing I would say, I think it would be almost impossible to have one today without leaking. Uh, you, you know, and I mean, there have been some proposals even that you, you know, you take a group, you drop them in the middle of Montana someplace and cut off the only phone line. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, let, they'll quickly figure you, it you, out. <laughs> yeah, I'll let them deliberate. But, I, you know, you, you would you would have reporters parachuting in and people <laughs> trekking through the wilderness to get there. Um, so at, at the convention itself, I don't think parties were an issue. Now, what happened is at the end of the convention... The, the delegates, and, and by the way, they violated or they bypassed, I guess would be fair, under the Articles of Confederation, amendments had to be adopted unanimously. 
Mm. And that, by the way, was another flaw in, in the articles. People could see that it wasn't working, wow. but there were a couple occasions where you get 11 or 12 states and then the, the 12th and 13th or the 13th would for, would refuse to, to, to go by it. But what the delegates did is they decided that the new constitution would go in effect among adopting states when uh, I think it was nine, nine out of the 13 had to agree to it before it went into effect. And so what happened is the, the country did divide into two different groups. Your Federalist, and we talked about the Federalist Papers earlier, your Federalist advocated support for the new Constitution. The Anti-Federalists were opposed to it. Clever and name. it was a very close contest in, in, in many states. Uh, the Federalists ultimately prevailed. Now, they did not initially get all 13 states. It took a while for uh, North Carolina, if I remember, had three different conventions before they finally ratified. Rhode Island uh, ratified even later uh, than North Carolina. So we actually had a time where we didn't have a full 13 states under mm -hmm. the new Constitution. But then, then what happened in... In Washington's administration, which began in 1789, Hamilton's proposal for a national bank divided delegates among, or divided the nation among those who said, yes, this is an implied power of Congress, and those who said, no, the whole purpose of a written constitution is to nail everything down. It's not specified there. So that was sort of the beginning of the two party system, which has you know, Federalists died out and replaced by the Whigs. Whigs died out and replaced by the Republican Party. And frankly, I would not want to venture right now what the next 20 years will look like in terms of, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to have a third party that could possibly, but I think either of the two major parties have enough divisions within them uh, that they could split. So to create we'll more parties or different parties. Yeah, and again, the, the one of the one of the reasons that some people like the electoral college system is that they believe that it enhances a two party system, as opposed to a more. In other words, that prize of the presidency means you want to have as broad a coalition as you can. Mm -hmm. And if we had if we had four or five different parties, you might have a lot more elections going to be. By the way, if if nobody gets you know, 278 votes, it goes to the House of Representatives. And here's what most people don't know. They choose among the top three candidates, but they vote by states. Oh. And this, this, by the way, is one of, if you remember back to, obviously you do, the 2020 election, one of the hopes was you could tie up enough states at January 6th where nobody could claim a majority. And then when it went to the House, I believe the breakdown, I could be wrong, but I believe it was like 26 to 24. There were more Republican dominated states than there were Democratic states. Mm -hmm. And if each state voted according to their party, uh, it would have resulted in Trump. And, you know, this is very, it's very fascinating. Trump did not, Trump has not in two elections gotten a popular vote majority either time. Mm. Um, mm. Clinton had more in 2016 and Biden right. more than 2020. The Electoral College worked to his favor in the 2016 election. And he was hoping if he could bring it back to the House that it too would work in his favor. Okay, wow. So let me, with that, um, since we're about at that hour for our program, let me run us to... The amendments, because I, I remember you saying that there were at least or was at least one, maybe two who were holding out because they didn't want to sign without right. amendments. So how did that come about and when did we get the amendments? Right. Well, first 10 amendments, which we mm -hmm. today call the Bill of Rights, were adopted basically in response to anti-federalist critiques that, you know, if we if we ought to have more explicit guarantees. What if Congress tries to establish a national religion? Well, 
the Federalists said, well, they have no power to do that. Don't worry about it. Right. Of course they don't. Congress wants to suppress freedom of speech. Congress doesn't have any power. It's not in there. The Federalists say that's not good enough. Uh, we want Ten Commandments, or you know, so, we want something there. <laughs> you in caught writing. me there. <laughs> right. uh, we want something in writing, and that's what they got. Hmm. And you know, to the extent, you know, this does show. I mean, it shows that no matter how good something is, it's rare that it can't be improved by discussion and debate. And most people think that it was a mistake. That now I should tell you, in the first hundred and twenty-five years. Bill of Rights made almost no difference at all. It's oh. you go far and wide to find a court decision based on the Bill of Rights, partly because it initially only applied to the national government. Oh, right. The, and then the it states. was later applied to the right. states. Um, but I, I think in retrospect, most of us are glad that we have a provision for free exercise of religion you know, freedom of speech, that that sort of thing. Yeah, as an attorney, I really like those fourth through sixth amendments. Yes, you do. <laughs> those, those are kind of my favorites. Um, yes, I get it. <laughs> I've argued them many times in court, uh, quite fond of the little things. Yes. And so, but when, okay, when was the Bill of Rights ratified okay, in was, comparison yeah. to the original Constitution? Right, it was the first Congress... James Madison's, who had not originally supported the Bill of Rights, uh, but had, when he was elected to Congress, had said, it can't do any harm. If this is what we need to get the Constitution adopted, I will support it. Uh, he introduced it in 1789 in the first Congress. First Congress did vote for it, although he had to, you know, it took him a while to convince people that this was more important than setting up the Treasury Department and other issues. Uh, it was ratified in 1791. Okay. So, and then so you know, a little back, later, a, a little later, but not, you know, again, given the transportation and communication of the day, that's relatively quick uh, ratification. But so that was 1789. Well, that's when it goes into the constitution goes into effect. 1791, the bill of rights is adopted. December. Okay. 15th, maybe somewhere along in there. Right. So the Constitution was 1789. The well, it's when it goes into effect. Correct. It's signed in 1787, yes. So it went into effect in 89. The Bill of Rights was 91. And that right. was the first 10 all in one clump. Yes. There were 12 originally proposed. 10 were adopted. One subsequently was adopted 200 years later as the 27th Amendment. And, and so... For our listeners, again, this seems like it's been so long ago that we studied these topics. And frankly, now I don't know how many people are actually taught this. But how many amendments do we have? 27. 27. So in but over 10, yeah. 200 years, we've only had 27 amendments. Right. And, and 10 of them were all at once. 10 were at once. 13th through 15th were adopted from 1865 to 1870. The 16th through 20th or 16th through 19th were developed, were adopted from like 1913 to 1920, no, 1919. Uh, so they tend to come in clumps. And when was the last time we ratified uh, one? Uh, hold on. <laughs> uh, please tell us. <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to punt on that one. The 27th Amendment is that odd one. It's the one that was proposed as part of the oh. Bill of Rights and was adopted maybe, I want to say 1991-ish, mm. uh, but I bet I'm wrong. It's been a hot so, minute. Yeah. Anyway, well, let's see. Amendments through 27, well, I was a year off, 1992. Okay. And the one before that, 1971. And that was uh, giving 26-year-olds the right to vote. Wow. I'm sorry, giving 18-year-olds the right to vote. 26-year-olds. Yeah. Amendments, yeah, no, that's amendment. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, is there anything, as we wrap up here, is there anything else about the creation of the Constitution or the convention that to you stands out the most as something you hold on to, whether it's something funny, something wise, something interesting, something to take well, forward. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I think it gives some hope 
that people can in times of crisis and you know maybe maybe it was good that it wasn't such an immediate crisis mm-hmm. that that's all people could think about but at a time of governmental dysfunction that people who still believed in the ideas of rationality were able to get together realize that nobody was going to get everything that they wanted yeah. but that it was possible to form a more perfect union and they accomplished that well may we all continue to strive toward that more perfect union And thank you for joining us. And you can check out, everybody can check out um, the list or at least a larger list of Dr. Vile's books and publications on the website for the Honors College. We're going to drop that down in the links and descriptions that we have. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. We have, it's the, Through the Law Unscripted is our main channel, and this is the Weekly Wine Podcast. So like and look at and subscribe to both so you can continue to be notified when we're up next and um, can can follow us and encourage others to follow us too. We also have a link. We have an affiliate link with Quimby Bar Review. So law students, I know the current time that we're doing this in September for Constitution Week isn't quite on your radar as far as the July and the February bars, but don't forget they're coming up. We do have a link that will give you 10% off. And the Law Unscripted itself offers some bar supplement programs as well as law school exam programs and some mock trial hopefully coming soon. So thank you all for joining us. Dr. Vile, thank you again. You're welcome. And we will catch you next time on The Legal Weekly Wine.